All right, good morning, Mercy Hill. Uh, Nick here, happy to see you guys again. Uh, hopefully you are doing okay tuning in from your living room, whether that's on your TV or on your computer. Uh, welcome to Mercy Hill. Obviously, we continue to uh, use this virtual platform. Uh, hopefully, uh, it doesn't have to go on for too long, but honestly, you probably saw the updates and things that went out. It does look like uh, we're looking at a number of weeks, maybe even months. Uh, so we're going to always be keeping our, our ear uh, to the news and the recommendations of uh, people who know a lot more than us, and we'll just be following uh, their lead so that we can best love you, love our neighbors, love our city. Um, not ideal, but hopefully you found last week encouraging, and we're going we're gonna to get back into God's Word again this morning and keep going with the series that we began last time. Um, so if you did tune in with us last week, you'll recall that in light of the COVID-19 crisis, the pandemic now that our nation and world is facing, I, I, I thought it'd be best to step out of the, the um, Gospel of Luke series that we've been doing for years now and instead maybe deal with something that felt a little bit more front burner, felt a little bit more immediately relevant to the matter at hand. Um, now, I said last time that the most frequent command in all the scriptures, uh, though this may come as a surprise to us, we may have certain things in mind we think it would be, uh, what it actually is, is, are you ready for it? Do not be afraid. Most frequent command in all the scriptures, the thing that God tells us to do the most, the, 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 the command that comes at human beings from God the most in all the Bible is do not be afraid. Uh, there are literally hundreds of places in our Bibles where this command and others like it show up. And I said last time, what this immediately tells us is, is at least two things. Uh, first, it tells us that fear is, is nothing new. Uh, that fear and being afraid for human beings, it's kind of a part of the human experience. It's a perennial issue for us. It's not just something that crops up when there's a pandemic that we're facing. In fact, what we know is that uh, even if, and, and God willing, when this uh, coronavirus thing is done, uh, Rest assured, we will find something else to worry about, something else to be afraid of, something else to freak out about. That's why God is constantly having to tell his people throughout uh, Scripture, throughout the ages, do not be afraid. We're always prone to it. We're always prone to it. But the second thing that uh, we can glean from this being the most frequent command in all of the Bible is that actually God uh, is in control that God is over top of these things we're afraid of, that he's stronger than them, and he's able to turn this stuff for our good. Uh, when God comes and he looks at this situation over here and he says, do not be afraid of that. And then he looks over here and he says, now don't also be afraid of that. Don't, don't you be afraid of that. And he looks at these people and he says, don't you be afraid of them. And he continues this sort of thing throughout all the Bible. What we come to understand from this is that, listen, he's over top of it. He's in control of it. He's stronger than it. We do not need to be afraid. Um, it's amazing. What we realize is that there is nothing that escapes the boundary of our Father's head, heart, and hand. He knows what you're facing. He cares about you deeply, and he's able to work for your good. Therefore, the command comes, do not be afraid. So I wonder how you're doing with that. Uh, I know a lot of us are facing fears these days uh, and uncertainties and, and, and we're feeling insecure. If I were to grade myself and my response, I'd probably give, give me a solid C. Uh, not too good, but barely passing and, and, and we're making it through. Um, I said last time that my hope for this series that we're doing now, do not be afraid, dot, 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 fill in the blank with various things. Um, I was hoping that it would be kind of this sanctuary space for us where uh, I realize that week to week we may be doing better 
Uh, and then other weeks we may be doing worse. We may be feeling more paralyzed and more afraid. And I want this to be a place where you can count on. You're going to come. You're going to gather, whether that's in your living room or maybe we're allowed in, 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 in some time to be able to meet with uh, other members of, home, of our home group or, or other people at Mercy Hill. Uh, but you get together in this space and, and you know, okay, we're going to be able to kind of drag ourselves in here, fears, warts, anxieties, worries, and all. We're going to unburden our hearts before God and let him reorient us in his peace. We're going to set our minds back on who God is and the gospel, and we're going to hopefully find that shalom, that all comprehensive peace of God uh, coming back in. So, what I've said is that each week, because I have literally hundreds of, of, of texts to choose from for this, I'm just going to kind of drop us into one place in Scripture uh, each week, week by week, one place in Scripture where God uh, issues this command in one, one form or another, do not be afraid. And we're going to use those texts to kind of guide our reflections, guide our thoughts. So last week, uh, we looked at Genesis 21, and we drew out there uh, from God's dealing with Hagar and Ishmael, and, and we saw that, that okay, listen, when, when, when uh, Hagar is crying out in the wilderness, and she is weeping and near death, and Ishmael is doing the same thing, we, we, we drew out from that story, we do not need to be afraid. Why? Because God hears. Because God hears. But now this morning, we're going to turn to Deuteronomy 7, verses 17 through 19. And that's going to kind of give us another angle on this idea of do not be afraid. Uh, so before I read the text, let me at least give you a quick background because uh, we're kind of dropping into different stories. I realize that uh, we, we need to do a little bit to catch ourselves up to speed of what's happening in the context. Deuteronomy 7, and if you remember, uh, the whole book of Deuteronomy, this is Moses now kind of addressing the people of Israel. They're uh, just uh, east of the Jordan, east of the land of promise. They're about to enter the land of promise. They've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, it's been rough, and now they're about to enter enter into Canaan. And that is great news on the one hand, absolutely. Yes, finally we're here. But then on the other hand, things are actually about to get a little bit bumpy. Um, they don't just get to walk in like they own the place, set up their couches, set up their chairs, build their homes, and, 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 uh, and take over. Yeah, what's going to actually happen is, is they're going to be called now to come in and dispossess the land from those who are currently there. They're going to come in and they're going to have to, they're going to, have to drive out. They're going to be instruments of God's judgment upon these uh, pagan nations that are there. And in case that worries you, I can't say much about this. This is not cultural tyranny. This is not genocide or something like that. This is God's judgment. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but back uh, when God was telling Abraham about his plans for this and how he was going to give the land to Abraham and his offspring, Genesis 15, 16, he says, but you can't take the land now. Why? Because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So in other words, uh, okay, now the time has come when the iniquity, the sins of the people in this land has risen to such a level that God will no longer tolerate it. Therefore, as instruments of his judgment, God is saying, it's time, we're entering the land, and you're going to have to take it from these people, and you're going to bring down my judgment upon them. Now, uh, this is going to get real, real quick for Israel. Let's read what Moses says to him then in Deuteronomy 7, 17 through 19. If you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them. There's our command. But you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So will the Lord your God do to all the people of whom you are afraid. Having read that, let's pray, and then I'll kind of get us into the message for this morning. God, right now, even through the camera, into the computer or the TV, out the other side, God, we, 
we right now are your people together. And we are uh, admitting as one that we are tempted to be afraid. If it's not about the COVID-19 thing, then it's about something else. It is a perennial issue for us, God. We need your help. God, we need you to come into uh, this place. We need you to invade this space, invade our hearts, and bring your peace there. We need you to show us what it means for us to follow you, trust you, walk with you in the midst of these things. It's a chaotic time. It's a scary time. God, would you meet us? Would you use your word and and, and let your spirit accompany uh, this time we have together? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I've seen, and I imagine you have uh, seen as well in these days, many articles being run, whether that's online or in the papers, uh, trying to make sense of discussing the psychology of, of fear, looking at this whole COVID-19 pandemic thing and our responses to it, and trying to make sense of what we see. Um, people have been noting the various behaviors, and some of that we kind of discussed last time, like the panic buying and, and the hoarding, whether that's of, of masks or of the uh, hand sanitizer or even of uh, things that seem so random like uh, toilet paper. And they've been looking at this and observing these things and kind of wondering, what do we make of it? What is underneath all of this? What's going on with this fear? Well, numerous articles now have pointed actually out the fact that Uh, maybe what we think is going on is this sort of fear of the unknown. There's something about this fear of the unknown that is uh, especially crippling, uh, psychologically paralyzing and torturous for us. We we, we don't like what, what we don't know, what we can't seem to wrap our minds around, get a game plan for. We don't know how to face it. We don't know how long it's going to be. We don't know who's severely impacted. We don't know when the market's going to rise back up. We don't know a lot of things. And so there's this sort of fear that comes in because of it. Now, let me read to you a, new, uh, a number of places where this kind of discussion comes up. One article appears in USA Today. Uh, it, it showed up last week, and it says this. As the number of confirmed cases of illness grows, so too does the nation's collective uncertainty. Psychologists and public health experts say public anxiety is high, and it's largely fueled by a feeling of powerlessness. When we feel, oh my, there's a new boogeyman out there, it comes with extra fear, said David Ropik, an expert on risk communication. When we don't understand something, that leaves us feeling like we don't know everything we need to know to protect ourselves. That equates to powerlessness, vulnerability. Uncertainty about the nature and trajectory of the threat exacerbates a feeling of not being in control. It goes on and quotes another person here. It's a new, unknown illness. We don't know how severe it's going to be. We don't know how concerned to be, said Lynn Bufka, Associate Executive Director for Research and Policy at the American Psychological Association and an expert on anxiety, stress, and cultural issues. The idea, she goes on, that we can hopefully reduce transmissions through really good hand washing feels insufficient. It's not anything new, and how will you know if you've done it well enough? It's why many people are rushing out to buy toilet paper, face masks, disinfectant, and hand sanitizer. It makes them feel they are at least doing something, she said. So washing hands doesn't feel like enough for this enemy. Right. Because there's this unknown factor, we, we, we're, we're scrambling to feel like we're in control. And you're seeing some of these behaviors because we're scared. There's this fear of what we don't know, what we don't understand, what's coming in the future that we can't quite see. It's a bit foggy. And so we try to do what we can with little behaviors here or there to try to feel like, no, we're secure. <laughs> Look, we have a garage full of toilet paper. We are secure. Jonathan Tepperman in his article, Why Are We So Scared of the Coronavirus, is also trying to understand this fear and and these seemingly extreme behaviors, and he offers this up as an essential part of his analysis. Quote, the coronavirus is new, invisible, sometimes deadly, and still largely unknown. Not only are we far from a vaccine, but we still don't really know what we're up against, how lethal the disease actually is, or how many people are actually infected. As Michael Barkin, a professor emeritus of political science at Syracuse University, put it uh, to me in an email, 
the unseen, mysterious nature of this enemy makes it especially scary and especially ripe for all kinds of imagined explanations and anecdotes. Or an, an antidotes. So because we don't understand it, it makes it ripe for all these sort of fearful responses as we try to make sense of it. There's this fear of the unknown. Marshall Seagal, in an article for Desiring God, sums it up nicely for us when he writes this. While we are learning more by the hour, there's so much we still don't know and may not know for some time, if ever, about the virus, which is part of its staggering power. The awful fear of the unknown. No doubt you've been experiencing a bit of this lately. I know I have. Some of us have been experiencing this fear of the unknown a bit more uh, perhaps than others, but no doubt we've all been feeling it. <laughs> For me, uh, this kind of cropped up in a sort of humorous experience I had a week or so back, back when we were still able to kind of do more than just fist bump or whatever it was. And um, there were these uh, Mormon missionaries that came to my door and uh, wanted to engage them for a little while and knocked on the door. We saw them and I, we uh, opened and, and I started talking and we shook hands as, as they introduced themselves to me. And the moment I made that sort of contact with their hand, terror just kind of struck me uh, as I realized, wait a minute, these guys have probably shaken hands now with everybody on my block. And here I am uh, shaking hands with them here. Immediately, it was almost like, I, I kid you not, I could like feel the coronavirus like germs crawling on my hand, coming up my arm, like making their way, trying to get after my lungs. I could almost feel like my hand was burning. So I put my hand immediately into my pocket and left it there for the entire rest of our discussion. And the moment they left, went and washed my hands with a bucket of bleach. No, I'm just kidding, I didn't do that. I washed my hands with soap. And then I uh, sang the ABCs maybe two, three, four times and felt okay after that. But I looked back at that, I was like, wow, the fear of the unknown. Not sure what's going on, the panic that sort of rises, that gets a little bit irrational, you kind of lose your head a little bit sometimes. It's affecting me, I'm sure it's affecting some of you. We get scared when we look out at a future that's unknown, ominous, threatening. When we don't see or understand fully what God has planned, what he's doing or how he's going to do it, the temptation is to give into fear and lose our heads a bit. And really what we are experiencing is, is probably very similar to what these Israelites are experiencing in our text. I'm kind of making my way back to Deuteronomy 7 now. Because there, on the plains of Moab, just east of the Jordan, about to enter the land of Canaan, the Israelites are in a similar situation, or at least they will be very soon, as nations much bigger, larger, stronger than they. They're going to be coming up against these guys. God is saying, you're going to go in and take the land from them. You're going to have to walk by faith. You're going to have to trust me. Things don't seem good. This does not seem right. It seems ominous. It seems threatening. It seems scary. There's so much that they don't know. How is God going to do this? How long is this going to take? Will he really come through? Do we really have what it takes? Aren't these nations just going to mock us and make a quick end of us? It's a frightening thing. The temptation to give in to fear will be quite significant. So how does God attempt to help them with this? What does he say? If they're not going to give in to fear, if that's not permissible, if the command is do not be afraid, what should they do? Well, let's look back at our text. Verses 17 to the first part of verse 18. Read it again. If you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them. Pause. That's great. We know that. But how? What should we do instead? But you shall remember. Remember. Here's the idea. When what lies before you seems ominous and threatening, when the future itself is this frightening prospect and seems to have grown fangs. When you don't understand what, what God is doing, when you don't know what's coming, how it will go, what you will do, when you're feeling afraid, 
You're tempted to just say, they're bigger, they're stronger. This is bigger, this is strong. I don't know what to do. When you're tempted to be afraid, here is God's word to you. Remember. Remember. In other words, instead of unraveling in the face of what you don't know, set your mind resolutely upon what you do know. Remember all that you've seen God do up to, up to this point, all that he is, all that he's revealed, and stabilize your soul with those facts. Build yourself up with those realities. When you are called to step towards the dreaded fog you can't see, remember what God has revealed to you in the clear light of day. Step back for a moment before going forward. Cast your mind back to your history with the Lord. Remember who he is, what he's done, what he's revealed. And you'll find fresh strength start to course through your body as you take steps towards what is currently unknown and a bit scary. Do not be afraid. Remember, remember. What a word this is for us in our day and what a word it was for Israel and theirs. Now, for Israel here, God is drawing their attention back to the Exodus in particular, if you noticed. And so what I'm going to do with us here uh, this morning is we're, we're going to kind of begin with looking at the Exodus as well. I want to say, okay, listen, let's go to the Exodus and see what does remembering the Exodus, the great deliverance that God worked for Israel from bondage to the house of slavery there in Egypt, what does remembering that uh, event and the, the Exodus event uh, do for us? What do we learn? What do we remember? What do we know about God because of that? I'm going to bring out three things in particular that we know about our God because of what happened there in the Exodus. And what I'm going to do for each one of those three things is kind of first make sure we see them in the Exodus event itself. Then we'll kind of trace them towards really the fulfillment of the Exodus in, in the gospel and the cross of Christ and make a few application uh, points for um, us in our current situation. So uh, with that, you can now pause your, um, your computers, your TV, whatever, and, and uh, look at pause point number one in your worship guide. All right, guys, welcome back. Um, so now let's start to move into some of those things that we know from God when we go back and remember uh, the Exodus. The first thing I'm going to bring out, we know that God is faithful. In particular, when we go back to the Exodus, when we remember what he did there, we, we know that God is faithful to his word. I wonder if you realize that this is really how the whole Exodus event began. The uh, people of Israel are, are I don't know, I don't know how familiar you are with the story. The people of Israel uh, first show up in Egypt during a time of, of famine elsewhere. And, and because of Joseph and his relationship there with Pharaoh and things, they're shown favor. But as they multiply and they grow in the land of Egypt there, and as uh, Pharaoh kind of, this one dies and another one rises up and, and, and power kind of changes hands, uh, the people of Israel now are seen as a threat there in the land of Egypt. And so instead of favor, they are kind of squashed, they are enslaved, they are afflicted. And there's this very significant moment in Exodus 2 uh, that we're, we're going to actually kind of spend some time with, uh, not just in this first point, but actually in the second one as well. But let me bring out something uh, with regard to this first point from this text in Exodus 2. Um, the people of Israel are crying out under the weight of this affliction. They're crying out to God, we're told, and they're groaning because of this bondage that they're experiencing. And then Exodus 2, verse 24, we read this, God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And from that, the great exodus from Egypt is set in motion. So what, what, wh how does the, the exodus event begin? It begins with God remembering a covenant he had made. 
a promise that he had made to Abraham and then to Isaac and then to Jacob. And God remembering that, God uh, says, listen, I am going to be, I have to be, I must be faithful to it. Now, when we talk about God remembering this covenant, it's not, we're not supposed to understand that he somehow forgot. And when he hears him crying, he's like, oh, goodness, uh, I didn't realize. Uh, thank you for reminding me. I better get back to it. No, the, the emphasis here is just simply on the fact that God is faithful to his covenant word, that God keeps it in mind, that his eyes are on his people, that he acts in accordance with his promise, that he will be faithful. I told Abraham, this is back in Genesis 15, that he could know for certain he could know for certain that though his offspring will be sojourners in a foreign land for some 400 years and they will serve the powers there and they will be afflicted. He says, listen, I want you to know for certain that I will judge that nation. I will bring them out and I will bring them to this land as my people. And God essentially is looking down at what's happening in Egypt and he says, time's up. The time for action has begun. God remembered his covenant. He would not forget them. Now, for us Christians, we understand that the Exodus event itself is a, is a picture really of the greater Exodus that Jesus works for us uh, at the cross. Uh, we've been held for so many years in bondage, not to Pharaoh, not in Egypt, but, but to, to Satan's sin and death. And God sends his son at the right time to redeem us from that. I wonder if you realize that the whole mission of Christ, uh, as with this initial exodus that we just looked at, is really the result of God's remembering his covenant and being faithful to his word. It, it, it's this idea that's driving the whole mission and ministry of Jesus. This God is faithful to his word. That's why I'm here. That's why this is happening. Uh, this is why in the Gospel of Luke, uh, way back when, in chapter 1, we looked at some of these things years ago. Um, we see how Mary and Zechariah talk about what's going on when the angel shows up and is telling them about the incarnation. Here's what Mary says. In uh, Luke 1, 54 and 55, God has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. This is just a continuation of what began back there with Abraham. He's remembering his covenant. He's remembering his people in mercy. He's being faithful to his word. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, says much the same in uh, verses 72 and 73 of Luke chapter 1. God has raised up the Messiah to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. It's the same idea, the same promise and word that brought forth the exodus there in Egypt is also what is bringing forth the greater exodus, the thing that that first exodus pointed to in the coming of Jesus Christ. His life, his death, his resurrection. It's amazing. Jesus himself later will describe his whole ministry in his whole life in terms of God being faithful to uphold his word, which is why after he's raised from the dead and he's talking to his disciples in Luke 24, verse 44, he says this, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Thus it is written, that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You see what he's saying there, don't you? In one sense, the gospel is fresh and new, but in another sense, it is just God being faithful to what he's been promising all along. The cross of Christ is the capstone of the covenant of grace. It's the climax of the plan and promise of God. God is being faithful to his word, as Jesus says in John 10, 35, scripture cannot be broken. One of the questions that often emerges in times of suffering, if we're honest, is, God, 
have you been lying to me? Have you been kind of speaking out of both sides of your mouth? You talk about how you're good. You talk about how you're strong. You talk about how you have these plans, how you're faithful, whatever. And then I look out when I stop reading my Bible and I and I lift my head up from the pages and I look out at my life. I look out at what I see. Perhaps even you look out and you see this COVID-19 thing and just worried about it. Just go, I don't see it. I don't get it. It seems like you're deceiving it or at least it seems like you've forgotten that you're not, in fact, faithful. But God's word to you and to me is this. Do not be afraid. Remember. Remember, the God who has been faithful, the God who was faithful to Israel and, and his promise there to redeem them from Egypt and bring them into the land of promise, the God who was faithful in the gospel to send his son for the, our redemption from sin and slavery to, to Satan and death, that same God is at work even in these moments. He will be faithful even in this, I know the future seems ominous. I know the circumstances are fogged up. But look back and remember, and you'll find fresh strength to be fearless and faithful in the present. It's as Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.13, even if we struggle with times of faithlessness, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself is who he is now with that you can uh, hit pause and um, uh, take a look at pause point number two on your worship guide All right, welcome back. Uh, now let's move to the second thing that we can know about God when we look back and remember the Exodus. And what I'd bring out here is this. We know that God is merciful. We know that he's merciful. We can start to talk now about the fact that God is not just true to his word, but he actually has us in particular on his heart. He loves us. He has compassion on us. He feels for us. He forgives us. I, I said we'd be returning to Exodus 2, and, and, and that's what I want to do here for a moment. Um, look at Exodus 2, 23 through 25. It's really quite moving. Um, again, we see the sorts of things that led to God's redeeming of Israel from Egypt in the first place. Here's what we read now in full. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. We see here now in fullness, the emphasis isn't just about God keeping his word, although that's there that he's faithful to his covenant. We see now this is about concern. There's care and compassion for his people in this. This is mercy uh, for unworthy sinners. This is God turning his ear towards the groans of his people, being moved in his heart to then, to then come down and act on their behalf. God is merciful. There's this amazing text in Deuteronomy 1 where um, God is, through Moses, is kind of talking about what happened at the Exodus here when, you know, through the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea and things, God brought his people out. And in, in Deuteronomy 1, uh, Moses uses this analogy uh, where it just says, listen, it was like, it was as if God, uh, in those plagues and, and, and with that great Exodus event, it was like he was kind of picking us up and putting us on his back. And then he just ran off with us out of Egypt through, you know, through the wilderness. He's been carrying us on his back through the wilderness now to the edge of the promised land. He's been carrying us, Moses says, verse 31 of Deuteronomy 1, as a man carries his son. I just thought, what a beautiful image. That's the image of this merciful God that we have. He just picks us up and he carries us through our hardships and our trials. Now, at this point, 
of, in my preparation, I thought about that famous Christian poem. And you probably already even know which one I'm thinking about. I think it's called like Footprints in the Sand or something. And it, it, it's, uh, it's where there's this, uh, we'll just say it's this girl who's, who's walking and she has this dream and in her dream she's walking and, and uh, God's kind of walking with her. Jesus is, is there with her talking about her life. And along this path, she sees different scenes of her life kind of flashing up. And, and uh, as they're kind of walking and, and reflecting on this stuff, she notices, oh, wow, okay, yeah, most of the time through my life, there have been two sets of, of footprints in the sand, right? And that's all nice. That's good. That's Jesus kind of walking with me. But then she kind of turns back on Jesus for a moment and says, now, I noticed something strange when um, when it got really hard during kind of the hardest seasons of my life. There's only one set of footprints and there's almost like this accusation. There's this almost kind of attack at this point saying, where were you when things were harder? Why did you leave me alone when when when, it, when I needed you the most? And of course, you probably know uh, Jesus's answer is, listen, uh, my child, that's when I carried you now. I have to be honest, and you'll have to forgive me if you have one of these posters up on your wall. I have for the longest time found that to be so cheesy. Uh, even as I was sharing it, I probably was uh, uh, smirking or whatever. Because Maybe it's just the images of the posters and, and the warm fuzzies that you're kind of supposed to get from that. I've always thought, oh, that's nice. That makes you feel a little warm and stuff. That's good, but that's not deep theology. That's, not, that's just kind of a silly story. Uh, for the sappy among us, right? And then I come to Deuteronomy 1 and I'm meditating on why the Exodus even began and, and what God is doing as he's bringing his people out and, and, and Moses is saying, listen, he's carrying you. He's carrying you from the house of slavery to the land of promise where you can be with him in his presence. He's carried you through the wilderness, the hardest stuff. He's been on his back and I go, oh my goodness, however cheesy that poem may have seemed to me, it's actually thoroughly biblical. That in the hardest moments of your life, God is right there, compassionate, caring for you, loving you, weeping for you, carrying you, carrying you on his back. Like a dad carries his, his kid. This is what God does. He carries us and we can't forget that. And again, of course, the Exodus event finds its ultimate fulfillment in the gospel of, of Jesus. And the work uh, on the cross. I, I said before, you know, that you and I were not merely groaning under the weight of Pharaoh's yoke as Israel was. No, ours was a far heavier burden. We're crying out for mercy. We're crying out for help. Ours is, is, is the burden of, 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 again, Satan, sin, and death. A far heavier burden than Pharaoh could ever put upon us. I think often of that thief on the cross. And I see myself in him crying out for mercy, for kindness. He knows he has no claim to. I'm suffering justly. I'm dying for my sin here. This is right. But still the cry for mercy comes out. You remember what he says in, in Luke 23, verse 42. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I know it's a long shot, but there's something about you as, as I've been watching you on the cross there next to me. Uh, there's something about you that says, maybe there'll be mercy for me from you after all. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And all oh, the wonder in our Savior's response, verse 43, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It's as if Jesus was saying to him, Look at me, look at me. In this hour, I am carrying the burden of your sin. But in the next hour, I'll be carrying you on my back with me to glory. Our cries for mercy, they are met fully in the person and work of Jesus. He moves towards us with compassion, with grace. He puts us on his back and he's carrying us through to glory. So one of the questions that emerges in our times of suffering, if we're honest, is, is something like this. God, have, have you abandoned me? Have you abandoned me? 
Do you even care about me at all? Uh, you may be saying this in the midst of this COVID-19 thing. Where are you? Are you even here? Do you care about me and what I'm going through and the stress of this situation? But in the face of all that we don't understand or know, we can remember and reroute ourselves in what we do know and what God has already revealed, that he is merciful and he will carry us yet through this as well. I was reminded of Paul's word in Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The God who in such mercy and compassion for us gave up his only beloved son on the cross will not now withhold his kindness, withhold his grace from us. No way. That's our proof point. <laughs> That's our proof point. You go back and you remember you did not withhold your highest treasure. I know you will not withhold whatever I need in these moments. But even though I'm tempted to be scared, even though it seems like things are going wrong, you're here, you care, you're merciful. And with that, you can pause and consider the questions under pause point number three on your worship guide. All right, welcome back. Now let's consider this third and final uh, thing that we can know of God, even when the future is uncertain, when we go back and we remember what he's revealed, in particular at the, the Exodus. Um, the third thing that we see uh, is this, God is stronger. God is stronger. And this is very important because up to this point, we're not even sure God can really be of help to us. And here's what I mean. If God is faithful, and he is merciful, but he is not stronger than whatever it is we could be facing. Then the, the reality is maybe he, 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 he makes a good promise and maybe he wants to help because he has a good heart, but he's not able to come through for us. He's got to be all of these things or it's not helpful. And the reverse side of things, if he is strong, if he's stronger than whatever we may be facing, uh, if he is bigger and, 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 and can throw more weight around than any of our trials, uh, but he is not faithful and he is not uh, merciful, then he is also, therefore, not a God we can trust and rely on. And we probably still should be afraid because though he is able, he may not want to help. But if God is all of these things at once, faithful, merciful, and stronger, than anything we could face, then we know we have a God who can be there for us in our darkest hours. Then we truly have the God of the Bible, the God of the Exodus, the God of the cross. In many ways, it's this God is stronger piece that's kind of brought out with the most emphasis back in Deuteronomy 7, is it not? Look back at verses 18 through 19 with me. Uh, where Moses says this, Remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. The great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. The mighty hand, the signs, the wonders, the, the trials that he brought upon the people of Egypt. You see, there's, there's an emphasis in our text on his strength, on his might. That he is stronger than anything you will be facing, Israel, when you move into the land of Canaan. I know they seem greater, stronger, mightier, more in number. But they are not greater, stronger, mightier than God. And your God goes with you. Now, in Deuteronomy 7, he's talking in particular here about the ten plagues. And the parting of the Red Sea and things. The power of God that was displayed in the Exodus event. And his delivering them from uh, the people of Israel from the house of Egypt. Now, it's interesting. I don't have time to go into all of this now. But I wonder if you realize that what God is essentially doing with the ten plagues is, if I could put it uh, uh, somewhat bluntly, he's, he's undressing, as it were, the, the gods of the Egyptians in exposing them uh, as false and impotent. He's just embarrassing the gods 
of Egypt. So you see, the, the Egyptian people, they, they were thoroughly polytheistic. They had gods for everything, gods that kind of governed every aspect of the natural world and stuff. So they had a, a god of the Nile River, a god of desert storms, a god of fertility, a god of healing, god of crops, god of harvest, god of the sun, god of the sky, god of childbirth, and on it goes. And you're starting to see perhaps how the plagues were a direct affront on the authority of those gods. G Yahweh is, as it were, undressing them, saying, listen, they have no power, exposing them for what they are, shams and lies. So God, the one true God, Yahweh, shows up and he pushes plagues into all these different dimensions that these gods supposedly have authority over. So he turns the Nile to blood. He brings gnats from the desert dust. He strikes the people with boils and no one can heal it. He destroys the crops with hail and locusts. He turns the sun to black and he kills the firstborn sons. All of it is this sort of polemic against the gods of Egypt as if to say there is only one. I am stronger. You see, when you think about it, God could have easily uh, redeemed Israel with just a strike of his hand, a single, a single stroke of his hand, and the people of, of Israel could have come out. But instead, it's this sort of, you know, flash and fireworks and fanfare. And you're going, why, why all of this? Why, why make such a big deal? Let's just get this done. Let's get the people out and go. Why 10 things and then the Red Sea and all this stuff? Well, he's making a point. You see, God is not here just trying to redeem his people. He's trying to reveal something of himself to us, to his people, to Egypt, and to the nations all around. Namely, that he is stronger. Whatever gods you're trusting in, whatever thing you're thinking you should fear more than anything, Yahweh is above that. That's the point. That's why Moses would come out in Exodus 15, 11, in this song that he sings on the other side of the Red Sea, he says this, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome and glorious deeds, doing wonder. Who is like you? You just, you just showed us. There's none like you. There's none stronger than you. And therefore, you see what God is doing. Why elongate the process? Why, why go through all of this there in Egypt? He is wanting to have something that when the people make their way through the wilderness to the promised land, he can through Moses in Deuteronomy 7 say, do not be afraid. Remember. Remember what I revealed. Remember what you saw. I took the most powerful nation on the planet at that time, and I just left them in, 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 in a pile of rubble, as if it was nothing. Don't be afraid as you step forward towards these other nations. I can handle it. Now, this of course, as, as Christians, uh, is something that we can take even further, right? Because again, and I told you I just was going to do this with each one, we, we are not facing uh, the false gods of, of Egypt and Pharaoh and things. Instead, we are facing those ancient foes of, of, of Satan, sin, and death. These things that we are, stand powerless against. And at times, we may look out and go, man, even God seems to be powerless against these things. Where is he, right? But we'll talk about that in a moment. One thing that the cross displays with utter clarity is the fact that God is stronger, that Jesus is stronger than all of those things, than everything that could possibly shackle us. He has the authority and the ability to break it. Colossians 2, 9 through 15. Let me just read this to you. And I want you to hear how he's almost kind of systematically breaking through Satan's sin and death and setting us free. This is what Paul writes. In Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you've been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, 
having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, their Satan in the demonic realm, and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him just undresses the devil. You got nothing on my people. He just defangs sin. Where is it? Where, where's your bite? There is no more bite. He overcomes the grave. That is our savior. That is the gospel. That's what we hope in. That's why we do not need to be afraid. He is stronger. One of the questions, among the others that we've been talking about, that emerges in times of suffering, again, if we're honest, is, God, are you even able to help me? Right? God, I, I look around and it seems like, maybe you're looking at the, the COVID-19 thing, and you're going, it seems like death is getting the upper hand. It seems like chaos and, and madness is winning here. But in the face of all we don't fully understand or know, God's word to us is again, do not be afraid, but remember, God is stronger. If our God is able to overcome the grave, he can overcome the coronavirus or whatever else we may be facing. So here's just final exhortation to you brothers, sisters, in the midst of all this chaos, in the face of what we don't know, the fear of the unknown as we step out into the fog day by day, and we're kind of wondering how long is this going to last, this shelter in place thing? How long are we going to be dealing with COVID-19 and the virus running rampant in our culture and our world. When are the markets going to recover, if ever? What's going to happen with my job? How in the world am I going to homeschool my kids and work or whatever else at the same time? What if my grandma or my grandpa comes down with it? What if it mutates and becomes something that can affect me with more severity, like perhaps they're seeing? Instead of giving in to fear and losing your bearings and all the worries and what ifs, hear again God's word to you. Do not be afraid, but instead remember. Plant your feet down firmly in what you do know of your God and your Savior, that he is faithful, that he is merciful, that he is stronger than anything you're facing. We'll get through this. Love you guys. With that, um, I'd encourage uh, someone in the home actually to close in prayer. And you can uh, maybe even before that pause and, and look at the uh, pause point uh, number four questions. Hope you have a wonderful week. Love you guys. Bye.